I'm making this video in direct defiance of the workings of deception that began on August 21st, 1944, 70 years ago. The British Foreign Secretary weighing in on all of this, expressing a good deal of concern because on that tape, the executioner, the murderer of James Foley, appears to have a British accent. Intelligence services on both sides of the Atlantic now working to try and identify his murderer, the friends and family of James Foley, remembering his life and his career as a journalist. The ISIS video is simply too horrific to show. The man being executed by beheading is James Foley, a freelance journalist kidnapped in northwest Syria on November 22, 2012, Thanksgiving Day. The man who beheaded an American journalist recently may be a Londoner named John, according to the New York Daily News. Is this murder of an American by a British terrorist on August 19th an indication of something more? Only a few days before the UK announced they would not join the US in airstrikes against the Islamic State militants. This in light of the UK news report that ISIS supporters were openly recruiting members on London's Oxford Street saying, the dawn of a new era has begun. The dawn of what new era? Could that be a reference to the new era that Bush referred to as the New World Order? The managing director of the Anti-Extremism Foundation said the recruitment of Islamic State supporters is a clear breach of the law, but should not be a surprise since around 500 British nationals have already joined up with ISIS. Why is the Washington Post asking if ISIS conquests are the end of the Sykes-Picot Agreement instead of asking if this is the expansion of the 1916 British and French borders? For those of you that are not aware, Britain already owns Iraq. They've owned it since the territories were separated during World War I. The Sykes-Picot Agreement divided the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire between France and England. This is the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916 as recorded at Yale Law School. Area A for France and Area B for Britain shall have priority of right of enterprise. In the blue area of France and in the red area Great Britain shall be allowed to establish direct or indirect control as they desire. And in the brown area there shall be established an international administration. There shall be freedom of transit for British goods and French goods. And the boundaries of the Arab states shall be continued on behalf of the two powers, France and Britain. Russia, Turkey, and Japan were also minor parties involved in this treaty as well as Italy. You can see on this map here the red zone of Iraq was designated under direct British control, the tan zone B designated as a British protectorate, the blue zone under direct French control, and the light blue zone A as a French protectorate. These are the modern countries of Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Israel, extensions of the British and French empires. Also notice all of Israel was controlled by Britain with the upper portion designated as international to be shared with France and Russia. Are we to believe the Islamic militants, of whom at least 500 are British, are only striking outside of the area under direct British control coincidentally? The Brits controlled the Tigris and Euphrates south of Baghdad since 1916, and recently the militants have taken control of the areas north of Baghdad which are the two areas not under direct control, the only two areas designated as protectorates. It's also possible ISIS is the continuation of the UK's domination and conquest of the area. That becomes clear when we look at the history. We're supposed to believe Britain's domination of Israel was discontinued when Israel became a nation on May 14, 1948. Yet the United Nations, who orchestrated the creation of Israel in 1947, was itself created by the UK and France. It was established in 1945 as a replacement of the League of Nations, and the League of Nations was the next phase of the Interparliamentary Union, which was established by a Frenchman and an Englishman. Did you catch that? France and the UK are the founding powers of the United Nations who created the country of Israel, the land they already conquered. What possible agenda could an atheist government have for restoring the land of Israel? Could it be a maneuver to control a country established by a strong belief in the God of Israel? Are the royals really the nurturing feminine power they present themselves as, or is there a government behind the curtain that holds a 200-year-old grudge against the God-fearing nation that rejected their gift of dried leaves in exchange for our submission?
Are they still insulted that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Is there a minority of powerful Brits who still, after all these years, resent our continued defiance of their domination in the War of 1812 that they marked that 100-year anniversary with the capture of an innocent American journalist on our day of Thanksgiving? The President of the United States on March 11, 1815 said, quote, The Senate and House of Representatives of the United States have, by a joint resolution, signified their desire that a day may be recommended to be observed by the people of the United States with religious solemnity as a day of thanksgiving and of devout acknowledgments to Almighty God for his great goodness manifested in restoring to them the blessings of peace, unquote. Our final independence from Britain was again declared in 1815, but was it really over? The men from France and Britain who founded the United Nations didn't just fantasize about how they would control the whole world. They do control the whole world. All seven continents are in league with their front for peace. Out of all those countries, only four have refused to sign the treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, and their own country of Israel is one of them. Is it just a coincidence that the little country of Israel, created by Britain and France, refuses to sign a treaty with the rest of the world agreeing to not nuke everything? You might think that because the majority of civilians are not concerned with war and harbor no resentments over the refused submission of certain countries, that there also must not be anyone in power who would harbor such resentments or plan retaliation. To that I implore that you consider if that logic has ever applied in any war of history. When has it ever mattered that your brother or sister of another nation did not wish to go to war? They follow their leaders regardless. But if you still doubt this resentment could still exist amongst a powerful few, consider this article from Canada.com which says, quote, A provocative new monument in downtown Toronto that gently reminds onlookers who won the War of 1812 shows a giant British toy soldier towering over a toppled American figurine, unquote. This statue monument showing the toppling of America was set up on the very day our current president was elected into office. Now I ask you again, if there were no resentment over our independence, then why continue pressing the issue? What is happening now is so important that the God our American ancestors so frequently referred to warned us of what is about to happen. The God of the Bible warned there would be four great empires starting with Babylon and the fourth will be a world government that will seem to go away but will secretly rule by coming in peacefully. That this ruling power will rise out of one of the four Hellenistic empires that Greece was split into and that deceitful world government of peace will come to power at the end of the fourth Greek rule which was the Ottoman Empire. That book of Daniel so accurately predicted historical events, telling us the United Nations has made a treaty with the whole world only to work deceitfully behind the scenes, that it gave us the exact seven-year period in which this desolation will occur, 2009 through 2016. Wake up, America. They've been systematically destroying the strong with persecutions, oppression, murder, and war, leaving us vulnerable to attack. And as I said to my four-year-old son, who, as I was preparing this video, randomly blurted out, Mommy, the Redcoats are coming. I replied, No, sweetie, the Redcoats are about to fall into their own trap. It's God who's coming back.